All right, so we've been through the pumps. Now we're going to look at the actual gauges. Now, first of all, on slide 84, we're looking at uh, something to consider in terms of those pumps, which is your rough vacuum, is your four pump, which is your, uh, which we've demonstrated, your scroll or direct drive, your high vacuum, your four pump plus turbo pump, or a four pump plus a diffusion pump, which you're probably not going to use, and your ultra high vacuum, your titanium sublimator, and ion pump. Well, if you look at slide 84, you'll see the world's largest vacuum chamber. This is something that NASA uses, and it's 100 feet in diameter, 125 feet tall. It has uh, 10. It has a huge number of pumps. Uh, you can Google this and take a look at it. It's a pretty amazing facility. Now this brings us to. We mentioned that those pumps cover different ranges. You now are going to look at pressure measurement and slide 86 is handy because it shows you there's a number of different ways to measure pressure. If you're doing a paper, you're, you're going to report it in millitor or pascal. You'll see an awful lot of reference to tor and, uh, and this gives you a conversion. The pressure gauges we're going to talk about will be the Borden thermocouple, the baird alpert ion gauge, and the cold cathode or penning gauge. Why do you need multiple gauges? Well, when we showed you with those pumps, we're covering a range from, oh, you know, atmosphere down to 10 to minus 10. It's not realistic to expect a gauge to cover that entire range. The first pump, our uh, first uh, gauge that we're going to look at is the Borden gauge. And in this case, it's a closed tube connected to a pipe and um, by the way included with the course we've given you several videos there's a nice little one of this and several of the pumps and what occurs is that you actually when you put pressure into this you'll see it would tend to bend this out and that's hooked up to a gear which allows this needle to move. And you've seen this type of gauge probably everywhere. If you look at any of the regulators on your, um, uh, for dispensing gases from a cylinder, you'll see that, uh, you'll see this kind of gauge. It's a very simple gauge. You have to realize it's not supremely accurate. So don't use this to do an experiment where you need exactly 20 PSI. You can see that in this one, it looks like they bent it over their knee or something to achieve this. Um, this is more typical. You'll see something like this, and it'll be hooked up with some gears to provide the, the uh, transfer uh, of the needle to show you pressure. So uh, the next gauge we'll go to is the thermocouple gauge. All right, now we're on slide. Um, 90 and the thermocouple gauge works pretty simply. You actually have a set of two pairs of wires. One's a thermocouple and the other's a heater. Here um, you change in temperature the heated wire is measured with the thermocouple and the heat transfer of the wire increases with gas pressure. So it's a simple arrangement when you look at inside one of these and it's a little hard to see that you actually see here's the four connectors and there are two wires and they touch in the middle that's it this may cost you a couple hundred bucks but that's all that's in there and uh, Roberto is good enough to cut this apart so we can see it see one them you can have them attached with all kinds of different connectors um, it's a rugged gauge. I've seen this filled with oil, dumped the oil out and it still worked. Slide 91 shows you the heater and thermocouple wires, which you may have trouble seeing with this video we're doing here. They're used in systems that cost millions of dollars. This is one on a, a multi-million dollar mass spectrometer. And uh, 
here is one um, on an, another system. Now, they're also called Pironi gauges. Those would be mounted, this can be mounted in any direction. The Pironi gauges should be mounted this way. And in this case, it's a different arrangement. You have a single fil filament, it's platinum, and the um, platinum filament is the heater element and the resistance is measured with the detector and the gas pressure is determined by measuring the current needed to keep the wire at a constant temperature. So relatively simple, no moving parts type gauges. You'll see them everywhere. They kind of last forever. You uh, shouldn't have too much problem with them. You'll see some older ones in different configurations. And if you're wondering why this connect set of connectors here, they use the same technology for vacuum tubes and those uh, then used, to, uh, that made it easy for them to adapt to this. So uh, slide 95 shows you this convectron or Peroni gauge cut apart. So now we'll go to the ionization gauge. All right, <coughs> this brings us to the ionization gauge. And um, very commonly used gauge, it provides a great pressure range, has a filament in it, so you do have to be a little careful with it. But uh, if you look at slide 96, you'll see that you have a filament, you've got a collector, and you've got a grid. The filament generates electrons, the electrons are attracted by the grid to the region of the ion collector, and there they ionize the gas molecules. More gas molecules, more current, fewer gas molecules, less current. All of these gauges that you're seeing require a controller, and we'll show you one of those uh, in a little bit in operation. So you have the gauge, and then it's hooked up to something which uh, may be able to operate several to several pressure measurement devices at the same time. If you look at slide 97, you'll see in here that, uh, for example, the same as what we're showing on this tube, there's a filament here. This is thoriated iridium. It's very specifically used because it's not as easily wiped out if you put some air in the system. The other ones are tungsten, and you'll see that as a little helical filament. And you can perhaps see that here. If you look at slide 98, you actually see a tungsten filament there. Now, the original gauges were in these glass tubes. What do you think is the problem with that? Well, it's a piece of glass exposed under vacuum. So if you turned around with something in your hand and hit this and broke it, First of all, you'd have this implode and then the glass pieces and everything in your chamber would have been rushed to air instantaneously. So now they have these new gauges, which are mounted like this into the system. And there's no risk of breaking the glass to uh, have that kind of problem. And uh, you'll see these, so if you look at slide 100, You'll notice that uh, on a system, you'll see this put in, that filament heats it up. The region of this filament is gonna be pretty hot. You will not be able to leave your hand on it. So the next gauge we'll go to will be the cold cathode ionization gauge, also called the penning gauge. All right, so now we're gonna look at the cold cathode gauge. And if you look at slide 101, you see the mechanism, we use an electric discharge, so you've got a high voltage, which is there all the time, and that's going to be here on this typical uh, cold cathode gauge. You have a magnet to help um, uh, provide a lot of uh, the plasma, which is going to ionize gas molecules. Once again, more current, um, higher pressure, and you need a controller to be able to convert that. It's uh, uh, about a thousand gauss magnetic fields, so don't put your credit cards next to it, and a couple thousand volts on this connector here. 
If you look at this, you'll see from the outside, you see a little plate. Here's that plate that's been removed. And inside, um, you'll see the cathode, which looks like this. This is a very good gauge. The only thing is over time, it gets kind of dirty. And especially if you mount it like this, which would be a mistake, because any dirt particles are gonna fall into it. Should be mounted like this or like this. So this is your um, gauge. It um, um, operates usually without too much trouble. Uh, but if you look at uh, slide 104, you'll see examples of one of these mounted. And that's again on a mass spectrometer that's worth millions of dollars. And how long do you have to go between now uh, uh, cleaning those uh, cathodes? Well, you know, how long do you have to wait before you have to clean it? Uh, if you are pumping something that's very low pressure, it'll probably be a very long time. Otherwise, uh, perhaps a year or so, you may have to take this apart and you can get kits to clean it. This gauge is what you will now see, and this is a compact cold cathode gauge. And some of these actually have thermocouple and cold cathode at the same configuration. So it's a different design. These are much more expensive and you may be, you know, in a range of like $800,000 for this. So vacuum components do cost money. And uh, you look at a little small vacuum system, which we'll show you lately, you may have easily $25,000, $30,000 invested in it. Turbo pumps can easily cost more than $10,000. And uh, that takes us through the uh, pressure gauges. We're now going to go to the vacuum system hardware. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Delicious things to eat. The popcorn can't be beat. The sparkling drinks are just dandy. The chocolate bars and the candy. So let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat.